day one of my Glasgow pilgrimages are mostly travelling. Leaving home at 9am and checking in at the Pacific Quay Premier Inn at 3.15pm on this occasion. As usual, a room on the quiet fourth floor overlooking the Clyde was requested and graciously accommodated by the lady on reception, the view being the reason I stay here. The rooms appear to have been threatened with a paintbrush since last year, but I could have been confused by shock, because exiting Queen Street Station I was met with brilliant sunshine and a temperature in the twenties. Was I really in God's own city? Rain will arrive soon, I confidently thought. Unpacked, I made my way to monitor the 286 Clyde Street construction. I'm still mourning the loss of the urban decay that stood there until its 2018 demolition. Obliterated to site a 300 room Clayton Hotel entrance through the adjacent Customs House with a planned 2022 quarter two opening. Perhaps I'll stay there for next year's trip. Unlikely. The glorious French cafe style exterior of the Griffin on the corner of Elmbank and Bath Streets remains closed, but it's reported to be reopening soon, despite rumours of its closure being permanent. Another long time closed pub and displayer of the coolest livery font in Glasgow, Variety Bar at 401 Socky Hall Street is back in business. Glasgow author Denise Mina mentions Variety Bar every five minutes in her Garnet Hill trilogy, but not once does she mention the heart of Glasgow, Paisley Road West. It's an outrage. I've spoken to the King about her behaviour. Making my way back from shooting in the evening, I passed the Mitchell Library and turned right onto Kent Road, recalling an encounter with a gent on last year's visit who insisted on buying me a drink in the Avalon. And later in the evening, I fell into conversation with a gent while passing the Mitchell Library, who insisted on buying me a drink in his local, the Avalon Bar on Kent Road. We call it the Stabalon, but you'll be all right with me, he said. Unfortunately, time was against me, and I needed to be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed for Sunday's mystery destination, so I declined his kind invitation. This year, however, I decided to don my journo hat and see if the pub's dangerous reputation is justified. It isn't, and I left with as many limbs as I entered. A relaxing fruit breakfast was consumed while lying on the bed sorting through yesterday's media, until the King of Glasgow picked me up for a trip to Dundee at 10.30. Making EC videos is quite a civilised endeavour. When I mentioned Dundee to the King a few weeks ago, he quickly replied, If I'm not busy, we can go in the car. It's not far, and it's like a smaller version of Glasgow. You'll like it. This was most suspicious, as A, it's 80 odd miles from Glasgow, and B, he never agrees to my suggestions without lots of abuse and bickering. So when I sat in the car and he said, First stop in Dundee is to pick up some scotch pies. His keenness was explained, with him adding, These are some of the finest pies in Scotland. Arriving in Dundee, we pulled up outside Ian Dunbar, the West End Butcher, at 195 to 197 Perth Road, and exited the car. But I wasn't allowed in the butchers with His Majesty. You stay out here. Maybe there was a password granting access to secret pies he didn't wish me to learn. No, cos you're stupid. Diagonally from the butchers is Pacamara Food and Drink, where we decided to lunch. We sat near the counter, and I thought I could feel intermittent vibrations under my feet. Unsure whether it was my imagination, I asked the waitress, who apologised, saying the vibrations were caused by the fan in the basement, and we could move if we wished. Mystery solved, we remained by the counter and commenced consuming our Colombian eggs lunch, which was most pleasant. A short stroll from Pacamara, Perth Road Park hosts a sculptural tribute to Dundee's breakout computer game, Lemmings. Lemmings was released in 1991 on the Amiga platform, produced by DMA Design, 
located on Perth Road. DMA are the force behind Grand Theft Auto. Wandering Dundee I was struck by the Baltic influenced architecture, which the King explained was due to their trading partners. For centuries, merchants from Dundee and the other major ports of eastern Scotland traded with Germany, Poland, Russia and Scandinavia. Trading between the northeast of Scotland and places like Gdansk and St Petersburg was two-way. People settled on either side of the Baltic, sometimes making their fortunes. They imported raw materials and exported finished goods. They built homes and places of work before and after Scotland's union with England. Parked on Riverside Drive to shoot the Tay Rail Bridge, a gent swam by in just a pair of trunks. Now I know Dundee is Scotland's sunniest city, but we both thought this was an ambitious act, and in my surprise I missed focus. Back in Glasgow the King pointed out Warmer Crescent, just off the wonderful, to my eyes, Paisley Road West. This Category A listed tenement was designed by Alexander Greek Thompson and constructed between 1857 and 1862. It possesses stark Eastern European tones. One could almost mistake it for a consulate and rises three storeys over a basement level. Ground floor channelled ashlar exudes solidity and strength, with each doorway stylishly elevated by disc detailing. Perhaps the King is planning to purchase a flat on Warmer Crescent as a base for my Glasgow videos. Unlikely. Very unlikely. In the evening, I took a leisurely stroll to Queen Street Station to buy tickets for tomorrow's trip. Another gentle start with fruit breakfast and media sifting, before wending my way to catch the 1051 Larbert train, where I'd arranged to meet the second member of Erased Culture's Scottish Mafia, Furniture Went Mad, who provides all the music for the channel. Traversing Sockyhall Street towards the station, I stopped and wondered if Tarquin had visited God's Own City with his Pen of Truth recently, but he would have included Bedwaiting Halfwits if the graffiti was his work. Furniture Went Mad met me at the station and we jumped into his car for a whistle-stop tour of Larbert and Stenhouse Muir because he was off to where the King and I visited yesterday, Dundee, at 1pm where he watched the tangerine-clad Dundee United lose 2-0 to the Jambos. Tour over and with 30 minutes to pass we nipped for a drink in the station hotel on Foundry Lone. A loan was originally a path which led to a cow field or a piece of pastoral land, which was called a loaning. Approaching the hideous mock Tudor and Pebble Dash vision, my heart sank. If the exterior is this ugly, what taste crimes will the interior commit? None. The interior is an unspoilt gem. A dark wooden bar with footrest wraps around the serving area, encompassing and an impressive optic and spirits display. Bar seating is provided by burgundy cushioned stools, matching the button upholstered benches beneath the windows. All topped off by my favourite feature, dentil moulding architrave. I could have happily stayed here all afternoon chatting. Apparently the landlord stands no nonsense though, so I was careful not to mention my penchant for ponting about in art galleries. Drinks imbibed and farewells issued, I headed to Larbert Old Church at Larbert Cross. The church was designed by David Hamilton and built in 1820. It has undergone two renovations, first in 1887 and 100 years after construction in 1920. The large cemetery expanded with Larbert's increased population, required to work in the Caron Company works. Caron cast many headstones and railings, or palings as they're known locally, for plot boundaries. In the church's adjacent car park stands the James Bruce Monument, which Bruce commissioned Caron Company to cast in 1785 to the memory of his wife, Mary. 
The obelisk was moved from its original location of the Bruce family plot in 1979 for cleaning. When it was returned, the crane's reach was insufficient to extend to the monument's original position, so it was placed, some say dumped, in the car park. Bruce was known for exploring Ethiopia. In her book, Plotting to Stop the British Slave Trade, James Bruce and His Secret Mission to Africa, Jane Aptekarev claims Bruce belonged to a secret network of British slave trade abolitionists. Viaducts are cool, especially when they span a picturesque river. Larbert Viaduct's foundation stone was laid in 1846, and under engineers Joseph Locke and John Errington, the viaduct opened two years later in 1848. Fourteen arches reach a high point of 18.2 metres, supporting a double track for 196.5 metres. Bracing the arches are old rails. In 1867, a wagon axle on a Perth to Edinburgh livestock train snapped, causing partial derailment and carriages falling from the viaduct. Cattle and sheep were crushed or drowned. The three occupants of the brake van, conductor, guard and a shepherd, received minor injuries. Larbert and Stenhouse Muir boast a plethora of paths and trails. Following the Karen Laid path from the viaduct brought me to the Grahamston Gates which would appear to be obscurely located, until you take into account the footfall from walkers. It is perhaps obscure for the 20 tons triumphal arch to be displayed in Stenhouse Muir at all, when it was cast by the Grahamston Iron Company works in Falkirk. The Caron Company, now operating as Caron Phoenix after their 1982 insolvency, refurbished the arch in 2002, hence its location outside the works. Turning onto Gladstone Road to shoot Stenhouse Muir Football Club, a man with a clipboard stopped me. Name. Why do you want my name? Your place, aren't you? Obviously, my journo reputation has reached Stenhouse Muir. The King will not be pleased. He refuses to recognise my journalistic prowess. You're not a journalist. You're a simpleton. Really? The guy with the clipboard had seen my camera? Bag floppy sun hat and assumed I was a press photographer. I am, of course, a bad photographer. The entrance fee to watch Stenny vs Kelty Hearts was £14, which I didn't think I'd be able to sneak past the King in expenses. Good job I didn't try. Stenny were beaten 4-1. The football ground was my final destination, after which I made my way to the station and back to God's own city. In the evening, after a salad meal from Lidl, I shut my eyes for a few moments, and the next thing I knew, midnight had arrived. So no shooting that night. I hadn't arranged to meet anyone today, so decided to walk the subway, chanting upon interest in architecture as I went. Kinnin Park was my starting point, and I walked anti-clockwise. The first thing to catch my eye was, of course, Urban Decay. The 1882 Pugin and Pugin designed Our Lady and St Margaret's Presbytery at 118 Stanley Street. Being Category C listed, it, as is the Glasgow Way, went on fire at some point. Opposite the Presbytery is a fine example of Wasteland, the perfect location for an avant-garde short film, if I ever get round to writing one and find some actors to work for the promise of meeting the King. You're on to plums there, mate. Low-sided metal rail bridges always please me, especially in grimy surrounds, like this one crossing Cook Street. Remaining on Cook Street, I spied this rugged red brick structure, menacingly daring anyone to spill its pint. Initial appearances suggested it once served as a GPO building, which was confirmed by the King, who informed me it was a 1930s built telephone exchange. A spot of faded grandeur next, 20 and 22 Bridge Street, completed in 1884 for the Commercial Bank of Scotland. Shame about the eye damaging stucco ground floor. From grandeur to brutalism, the grey, harsh, intimidating and lovely Cambridge Street multi-storey car park. 
brutalist architecture, the choice of real men. I like Great Western Road, not for elaborate structures like the James Miller designed 1898 Roots, Fruits and Flowers or the 1886 Coopers Building by R. Duncan, but for the austere, crumbling tenements that line the road. And of course the Kelvin Bridge. Great Western Road is not all good, leading as it does to Byers Road. The less said about Byers Road, the better. And then we come to Partick. Ah yes, Partick. A place with the insular self-absorption of those excessively pleased with themselves. It was at this point I decided to cross the Clyde by subway, minimising my time in Partick's self-congratulation. Purchasing a subway ticket, even the lady behind the counter gave me attitude. Doesn't she know of my journo renown? Of course not, because if it didn't happen in Partick, it didn't happen. Real men don't live in Partick, they live south of the river, on Paisley Road West. Emerging from Govan Station I continued towards Ibrox, but couldn't get a clear shot of the station because fans were making their way home from the Old Firm clash, which resulted in a 1-0 win for Rangers. Traversing Clifford Street, the gent on the left found the concept of shooting architecture a struggle to grasp, deciding photographing him and his friend celebrating Rangers' victory was a much better concept. As you can see, drink had been taken, but they were both amiable. Cameras are a magnet for those who have indulged in alcoholic beverages. They think photographers are desperate to capture their image. Like this gent in Newcastle, who shouted numbers in my ear while I was shooting the station and then demanded I photograph him. After Cessnock Station I continued to Kinning Park which completed the circuit. Having walked the subway I decided to ride it, again beginning at Kinning Park. The experience is akin to a fun fair ride, short sharp accelerations and decelerations, rattling, clanking and banging as it progresses. Most enjoyable and at £4.20 for an all day ticket, tremendous value. That evening I popped into McSorley's on Jamaica Street for a glass of lemonade. I was working after all. Poncing around with a camera isn't work. Returning to Pacific Quay along Socky Hall Street, there was a large queue to enter the Savoy nightclub. Blimey. I thought mainstream clubs had lost favour years ago. Back in the hotel room, my fitness band read 41,000 steps. A lot of work goes into making this channel a shambles. Lunch was arranged with a Falkirk genius, hello Andrew, the third and final member of Erased Culture's Scottish Mafia. Walking to meet Andy, I encountered the former McDougal Glass and China Merchants Building on the corner of St Vincent and Hope Streets its official address being 130 to 136 Vincent Street. Which set me thinking, what is the origin of Hope Street's name? Is it prosaically eponymous or does it have more uplifting connotations? Unfortunately, I don't know the answer. I met Andy at Queen Street Station. It was the first time he'd travelled to the station since its refurbishment and he was impressed with its airy and clutteredness compared to the cramped dinginess of previous years. Andy suggested the vegan 13th note on King Street for our nourishment. We arrived at noon to be greeted by a gent who was the epitome of geniality. A geniality he retained despite us showing little inclination to order while we caught up. We finally decided on three dishes to share. Chana dal with chapati, bruschetta with garlic mushroom and pesto and the special of the day Korean cauliflower. The meal had bags of flavour and texture. I recommend the 13th note if you're in the Merchant City, even more so because it's located in a dark satanic mill-like structure. Andy had brought me two delicious pieces of homemade blackberry tart for the train journey home tomorrow. 
When I ate them, a portly gent across the aisle looked longingly as I slowly savoured the tart, pausing after each bite to prolong the pleasure and his agony. Lunch finished, we jumped on the subway to Shields Road, intent on visiting Andy's old flat on the corner of Maxwell Road and Heriot Street, covered in the Falkirk Wandering video last year. All four of us decided to move into the derelict top floor flat at the end of Heriot Street in Glasgow's south side and live like the monkeys. There was Stephen on guitar, the bassist Eddie, drummer Barry, James the Cat, and me on piano and vocals. It's an unremarkable location, but full of Andy's memories, and he hadn't been back since leaving in 1982. After a very pleasant afternoon, Andy had to return home to walk his dog Reggie. So we bid adieu and he boarded his train. I fancied a spot of contemplation in the Botanic Garden sunshine. While there, the King texted to say there were remains of the old station still visible. Of course ruins are dear to my heart and I set off to find them. On this last night in God's own city, I meandered to Trongate, mindset on shooting the Mercat building, but it wasn't lit up, which was disappointing. The Trongate Tower was illuminated though, with a climate change projection, and most effective it was. I felt I'd earned a glass of lemonade in the pot still on Hope Street to close off the day. Day 6 resembled day 1, only in a north-south direction. Before leaving you with the King preparing and consuming one of his Dundee pies, I'd like to thank him, Furniture Went Mad and Andy for their time and help in making this video. There's no praise high enough for them. Gents of the highest order. Thank you. The Scotch pie, a unique example of Scottish cuisine. What's in it? Well, mince mainly. Minced mutton, if you're lucky. Lots of seasoning. There are many claims to the source of the greatest Scotch pies. Kilmarnock and Motherwell assert their pie skills. But it's in Dundee and surrounding area that lays the greatest claim to true pie glory. Every butcher and baker in the city seems to think theirs is the best. Many take their Scotch pies with baked beans and or a pile of brown sauce. For me, it's best with a healthy portion of peas, drowned in malt vinegar, sauce in the side, fit for a king. I'm still hopelessly in love with you, Glasgow, and that rain never did arrive. See you next year, sweetheart.